Hi and welcome for uh, welcome back to chapter four of this video series on CCNA3 scaling networks. And now we're going to look at uh, link aggregation or port aggregation and router redundancy. So what we're actually going to dig into is uh, first ether channel, which is a way to bundle redundant links and use them as one. We're going to look at the purpose and we're going to look at the two protocols to negotiate these links, PAGP and LACP. And then we're going to look at a first hop redundancy that is used to have redundant default gateways. Uh, we're going to look at an overview of different protocols and reasons for doing this. And we're going to look at HSRP, which is the first hop redundancy protocol that is used within this course. So first, looking at ether channel, as we established earlier in the course, using redundant links are good for redundancy, but one of the links will be blocked by STP. And this is sort of a bad way of using resources. So using link aggregation, it's possible to use both links and get enhanced performance as well as redundancy. So what will actually happen is that we will bundle two, link, uh, two or more links together and have them work as one. And if one link uh, fails, it will just be uh, removed from the bundle and the remaining links will still work. So the benefit here is that we can bundle up to eight links and use them as one. And we can do most of the configuration to the aggregated link or the port channel instead of to every individual port. And the benefits are, of course, that we can maximize performance with existing hardware. We can do load balancing on the links and we don't have to have uh, links being disabled by uh, by STP. So. And uh, this is a great way to increase the performance of a link without having to buy hardware. We can just bundle more and more links if we have uh, ports left in our equipment. So in this course, we're using ether channel for link aggregation and it has some restrictions. Uh, first, for a uh, to be able to form an ether channel, we have to ensure that all ports in the ether channel are of the same speed, i.e. all ports have to be fast ethernet or all ports have to gig be gigabit ethernet. We cannot, ma we cannot mix, so we can't have two gigabit ports and five fast ethernet ports in the same bundle. Uh, we can have up to eight ports in one channel and all ports in the bundle must be on the same VLAN and you should have the same uh, um, and if you're doing trunks, you should allow the same VLANs and have the same native VLANs, of course. So ether channel was uh, intended to be used switch to switch, but you can also use it from switch to any other device that supports ether channel. So for instance, uh, having a bundle going from a switch to server is quite a common impl uh, implementation. And that is because you would, uh, you would in several cases like to increase the bandwidth uh, between the switch and the server because the server is usually, uh, usually receiving a, a lot of requests from the clients in the network. So let's look at how to configure ether channel. Uh, what you do is you can configure ether channel in three different ways. Either you can do a static ether channel configuration, just saying that this should be ether channel on both way on both sides. Or you can use one of the dynamic protocols, PAGP or LACP, where PAGP is Cisco proprietary and LACP is multi-vendor. So if you're just going to remember one of them, learn how to do it the LACP way and you can talk to other devices than Cisco switches. So uh, how would you go about configuring an ether channel? Well, before we go, uh, go at it, we're going to look at the steps and it should begin with turning off all ports. And I really, really encourage doing this because I've tested it myself. And one thing that can happen is that when you set up two trunks between two, switch, uh, two switches or even more, then spanning tree will go bananas and start disabling them and strange things will happen. So if you just turn them up, off during the configuration and then you will uh, save yourself a lot of trouble. So when the ports are turned off, ensure that the ports on both sides of the ether channel are of matching speed and have the same VLAN configuration. Then we bundle the ports and configure LACP or PAGP. We do that by saying interface range to port that we want. And then we use the interface configuration command channel group, uh, the number we want to assign to it, mode, and then LACP or PAGP. We're going to have a look at that in the practical. So then we turn the ports on again and we manage the link as one port and then we will just do interface port channel and the channel group number and we can configure it as a trunk, we can uh, configure whatever we want to it. 
and we verify it using the different show commands, show interface port channel, show ether channel summary, and show interface uh, interfaces ether channel. So, uh, if there are any questions, put them in the comments field or ask me in class if you're here. Now let's get practical before we move on to HSRP. Then we're up and running with Packet Tracer, and as you see, we have a Packet Tracer topo topology with three switches, and we have port channel one, two, and three that we're going to configure. Uh, so uh, remember the prerequisites that the port speeds has to be same uh, over a port channel. So if we look at port channel one, we have to ensure that those ports are the same speed and those ports are the same speed. So here we have fast ethernet, another fast ethernet, that's good. And we have fast ethernet on the other side, that's also good. And uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is set host names on all the switches. Um, and we'll... We're just gonna do it, hostname s1, and even if you don't really feel that you always have to do all the basic configuration whenever you do a lab, I would at least encourage you to do the host names because that helps you keep track of your switches. And at least if you're like mine, if your mind works anything like mine, and that's going to be necessary in order to remember what the hell you're doing. So hostname s3 and life is good. So the first thing we're going to do here, as I said in the best, pra uh, best practice part, is that I'm just going to go in and shut down all ports. So we're doing interface range fa01 to 24. Shut down. And then we also have interface range gig 0, 1, 2, 2, shut down, same on the other devices, One to 24, shut down, gig 1, 1, 2, 2, shut down, and this is to avoid unnecessary uh, spanning tree troubles when we're building our four channels. And I'm telling you, it does happen. And I was actually, yeah, I've been faced with it a number of times myself, so I'm not joking. So, uh, and the reason why I did it was because if we consider this port channel down here, there are two links between S2 and S3. There will be a spanning three process taking place to break one of them. And uh, that can mess up with, with what we're doing. I'm, I've tested it, I know that it may not always work, so just make sure that you shut down and then take up stuff when you're working with it. So, uh, now we're going to configure ports as trunks and we're also going to configure ether channel. So starting with switch one here, uh, let's do LACP for port channel one and PAGP for port channel two. So what we have to do, if we start with port channel one, is that we do uh, interface range FA021 to 22. So first off, those are to be in port channel one. So uh, we do a channel group one mode. And this is the different modes we have. For, so what we're going to do in LACP and then we can do passive or active. If we do active, we will enable LACP on this side, and if we do passive, we will enable LACP only if there is an LACP uh, active device on the other side. So passive-passive will not form a port channel. If we do active-active, we're going to have LACP, and if we do active-passive, then we're also going to have, have, have LACP. In this case, we go active, and that's it. We were also asked to do them as trunks, but we can actually do that from the port channel mode. So we go exit here and we do interface port channel one, and we do switch port mode trunk, and we do switch port trunk native VLAN one. And we're not going to do a loud VLAN, but if we wanted to do switch port trunk loud VLAN and then do a list of VLANs allowed to traverse this port, we have to ensure that we do the same configuration on both sides of the Ether channel. 
So let's bring up this interchannel uh, with no shutdown. We also have to go down to the individual interfaces. Uh, interface, let's just do it the lazy way. Interface, range down, and we do no, no shutdown. And now we're going to go to the other side of that link, which is S3, and make it go. So we basically do the same configuration again, starting with interface range FA0 21 to 22. Note that it doesn't have to be the same port numbers on both sides, of course. Uh, so channel group one mode. And now we could should be able to have passive here because we have active on the other side and we're going to have LACP. And we're doing no shutdown uh, for to, to gently enable the ports. And then we go exit. Now it's not going to work because we have to configure it as a trunk. We do that on the port channel. Interface, port channel one, switch port mode, trunk, and switch port trunk, native VLAN one. So let's fast forward time a bit. And then we can do a do show ether channel. And we see that there is there, there is one, and we can do a do show ether channel one. No, we can't. Okay, what's the show ether channel for channel one? Show ether channel. Summary. Yeah, show ether channel summary, and you can see that we have one ether channel. It's called PO1 SU, that stands for in use and layer two. So that's what we expect. SU is good. And we have uh, the ports with a P after them, meaning in port channel. It's easy to think that it is passive or something like that, but P and SU is what we want. And we have LACP running as the protocol. So let's do uh, let's do two more. Let's go back to switch one. This time we're going to do a PAG P port channel for port channel two. So we do interface range gig zero one two two. We do channel channel group two mode. And then we can have auto if we want to have a uh, PAGP if the other side likes it, or we can have desirable to have PAGP unconditionally. Let's do desirable. Let's do the no shot to take them up. And let's go exit. And we do some interface port channel two. And then we're going to do switch port mode trunk. And let's not do anything else. Because if we're not configuring the default, the native VLAN, it's going to be the default, and that's good enough. So switch to exit. Let's do the interface range gig 0122. Uh, switch no channel group two mode tag P right. So we should be able to do auto. We do no shut to have them up. We go out and we're going to configure the port channel as a trunk. Like so. Then again, we fast forward time. Go to switch two. Do show ether sum. And you see that here we have PO2, SU again, seeing that it works. The protocol is PAGP and the ports are in the port channel. So I'm actually not going to do the final port. You can do it on, do it on your own. The, what I wanted to show you here was just if we go back and we go into an inter interface ring face zero something to something, and we do channel group mode and on that just enables ether channel and it will be enabled no questions asked 
So that's it for this little pack trace demo. Let's get back to our theory and continue on with HSRP. So HSRP is a first hop redundancy protocol. And why do we need first hop redundancy? Well, having one default gateway will cause hosts to lose connectivity if that gateway fails, right? So the solution is using a first hop redundancy protocol that allows you to present several routers as one virtual router and have the hosts configure the virtual router as the default gateway. Now the routers will decide on their own who is in charge of forwarding traffic at the moment. So if we try to look at this in a picture, you can see that in this case we have one physical router over here and one physical router over here. However, we're using a first hop redundancy protocol to configure them as one virtual router that is reachable with a 192.0.2.100 IP address and we will configure that IP address as the default gateway for all the clients. So the idea here is that this point one router here should be the active router and that handles the forwarding of traffic but if it fails the 2.2 router will take over. So that's actually what first hop redundancy is and now let's look at some different flavors of first hop redundancy protocols. So there are uh, quite a few, beginning with uh, the Cisco proprietary ones, which is first hot standby router protocol that we're using in this course. That is only for failover, meaning that there is one router ready to take over if the first router fails. There is also HSRP version 6, which is the same, but for IPv6. Uh, then we have gateway load balancing protocol, or GLBP, which is failover and load balancing, and is also Cisco proprietary. What is nice with load balancing is that you don't just have one router sitting around and waiting. You actually have one router that uh, two routers or more that are configured for load balancing so that they will share the duties of forwarding traffic. There is also GLBP for IPv6. And uh, then there are some virtual standards, the one that uh, or the op open standard, the one that you need to know about most is virtual router redundancy protocol v2 or VRP, and that is for failover and load balancing for IPv4, and then we have VRRP v3, which is the same for IPv4 and IPv6. There is also a legacy failover protocol that is ICMP router discovery protocol or IRDP that you can know about for legacy reasons. Uh, so if we go into H HSRP that we're actually going to configure, what happens is that you have two or more routers. Two is the common case, like in here you have R1 and R2 that are configured on the same local area network. And you configure them to uh, work as one virtual router and then you will configure the clients to use the virtual the IP address of the virtual router as the default gateway and then the routers will manage on their own who is currently listening and taking care of traffic and if the currently active router goes down the other one will take over that's the idea so how does this work well routers are configured in a group and they are configured to share, share a virtual IP and a virtual MAC address and the client will use the virtual IP as a gateway uh, so for this to work, the routers will elect a active router and the rest of the routers in the group will be standby. The highest priority will win and priority is a value that can be configured to be between 0 and 255 and the default is 100. Uh, and if the priority happens to be equal, the highest numerical IP address will win. So when a router is selected active, it will stay active until something triggers a re-election process and that is something that will happen whenever a router configured with preemption comes in line or when a configuration change for HSRP occurs. So whenever you uh, change something within the HSRP group, uh, then the, there will be a re-election and the new router with the highest priority will win. Uh, or if there is a router coming on that is configured with preemption and what preemption means is that basically that you configure the router to trigger re-election if it comes in line. However, you should know that pre preemption will only let a router with higher priority become active. So uh, if a router that is configured with preemption comes in line and it has the same priority as the current active router, it will still be in standby. So that's it. Let's just look at the configuration steps before we go do it on our own. 
Uh, what you have to do is begin with configuring HSRP version. One is the default, two contains some enhancements that are beyond the scope of this course. However, it is configured using a uh, standby version and the number you want. Uh, you then configure the virtual IP for the HSRP group. You do that by saying standby, group number, and the virtual IP. Uh, and then you're very practically done, but if you want to influence the election of active and standby routers on your own, you have to begin with configure the priority for the router interface, which you do with standby group number priority and the priority value. And then you can also configure preemption with standby group num number and preempt. Note that all of those are interface configuration commands. Um, so something that you need to know about is that if you're using router on a stick and then you will have sub interfaces for each VLAN and then you would have to configure uh, one standby group for uh, for each and every uh, VLAN interface having different standby groups is beyond the scope of this course so uh, it's more of something to know about it's something that you have to care too much about uh, so next we have some verification commands that can be good to know about show standby will show you a summary configuration information uh, or show standby brief that will give you even more dense information uh, there are also some uh, debugging that you can do so debug standby and then go error events or packets and that will give you detailed debug information during runtime which can be nice if swapping of active and standby router doesn't really happen as you expect so if there are an, aren't any questions, and we're moving on to the practical, if you are in class, ask me the questions where, where you're sitting. If you want to be in class, go to www.his.sc and apply for one of the nice courses, or even the Networks and System Administration Study Program, which is awesome. Or if you prefer to stay where you are, leave the questions in the comments field. Now we're going to look at HSR so for this um, for this practical i <laughs> for this demonstration i decided to go with a troubleshooting task just for just to be funky really uh, so the scenario here is that we have router one and two asking uh, acting as redundant gateways for uh, for the PCs or for the networks down here and basically what we're going to do is to uh, neglect the activities uh, activity instructions and just make sure that it works according to the requirements. So what we need to do is to have a virtual router IP of 192.168.1.254 uh, in group 1 and R1 should be the active router when it's functioning and R2 you should use the default HSRP priority. So let's start with looking at router 2 and just see uh, see the configuration here. And something that you can realize quite uh, quite directly with this specific task is that there are uh, an abundance of issues going on with the IP addressing. So someone has a duplicate address and how we're going to fix that, we're going to just do a quick show run and see what, if we can determine why this happens because it's extremely uh, annoying. And let's just see uh, gigabit ethernet and uh, that appears to be correct and there is the standby IP so let's turn to router 1 instead and we go to do a show run and look at the So here one thing is that they are in different standby groups and something that I'm just going to do that I like to do whenever things are just mashing with me with the error messages is that I'm going to just take down this interface. So interface gig01 shut up and then it's quiet. So now we're going to look at the configuration details. So a nice way to do this when you have and no idea about what's happening and you definitely have no idea about what is wrong is to just head to the running configuration. So we do show run and we can just go examine the uh, the HSRP configuration. So as we see here, it's configured as version one, that's fine. 
it's configured in standby group 11, which is wrong because it should be group one. So what we're gonna do is to do simply do no standby 11 and just remove all that. I'm gonna show you that it did happen, as you see here. Now there is no standby commands anymore, and we're just gonna rebuild the configuration. So what we're gonna have is standby group number one and IP. 192.168.1.254 and that is it. We can also do standby priority and we can do 200 because this was supposed to be the active router when whenever it's online. Uh, and then we have a priority higher than the default which is 100 and we also do preempt to ensure that it regains its active status if it comes in line after failure. So that's it. Now let's go see if we can fix router 2. And I'm going to leave this shut down because if there are issues, uh, there may still be all of those annoying error messages. So we go to R2. And you see that it's not whining anymore. Uh, and we go to show run just to examine the configuration. So if we go to the standby information here, you can see that it's version two, which is good. It doesn't have the standby priority command, which means that it's the default, which is according to the instructions, but it's in group 111, which is incorrect. So what we're gonna do is that we go interface gig 11, uh, one, and we're going to do no standby 111, and then instead we do ghost standby one uh, IP 192.168.1.254 and it's mm, it's not shut down so we go to we go back to the R1 and we can go no shutdown to re-enable the interface and now we're gonna fast forward time and see if the standby election took place as we wished so, first thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna go uh, do a do show standby. And we see that the state of this one is actually standby. So that is a little bit weird. It says preemption is disabled. So then the question is, and it says that the priority is 100. So the question is, of course, what did I, what did I miss? So let's go to router two, and we're gonna go do show standby. Here we see that it's active, and we see that the virtual log P is 192.168.1.254. So it does seem like we actually succeeded in, uh, in doing the standby group, but let's go back to router one and fix the priority and the preemption. So what we're gonna do is do show run. And we can see that we have standby one and we have standby preempt. So there was a mistake here in me not when I did the preemption, I didn't uh, enter the standby group. So standby group number preempt. Uh, and I guess that we have to do the same for the priority standby one preempt. So this is some changes that should trigger a re-election. And as you see from the output here, it does. So if we again go do show standby, you can see that this router is now the active router. And uh, so looking at the output of do show standby or show standby, you can see the state, you can see the interface and the group and the version. You can see the virtual IP address, which is the uh, IP address that it sh is shared among the routers in this group. You can see the active virtual MAC address, and you can see the local virtual MAC address. And in this case, you see the local virtual MAC address and the active virtual MAC address is the same. Uh, you can also see that preemption is enabled, that the active router is the local, and you can see the uh, IP address of the stand standby router. So now what we're gonna test is to ping from one of the computers to the server up here and just make sure that it succeeds. And as you know by now, 
uh, almost always the first ping within packet tracer is failing because it times out from the ARP requests. But now it succeeded. So the next thing we're going to do is go into, uh, into router 1 and we're going to do a shutdown on the interface. Then we're going to fast forward time a little bit and now the idea is that R2 should be the active router. And when we look at router 2 you can see that it is from the output down here. It changed state to active and we should still be able to ping but the first one should still fail of course and the second one succeeds and this is HSRP working for you in practice. So that's it for this video like uh, demonstration. If you have any questions go for the comments field uh, otherwise have a nice day and see you next time where we start to go into talking about dynamic routing. Bye!